Thank you. 
Hello everyone and welcome to another Nature Life Online. My name is Christina and for those of you who haven't been following up for the last few months, we are trying to bring uh, what goes on behind the scene at the Natural History Museum to your homes. Now, this show is live and we are going to have a very special guest today talking about dinosaur hands and answering all my questions but if you have your own questions please send them through in your comment windows in youtube on facebook and we'll try to get through as many as possible but i don't want to keep you any longer from talking about this amazing topic that is dinosaur hands so i'm going to introduce you to our very special guest today joao vascalator hi joao hi christina hi everyone thanks for having me Thank you so much for joining us today. How are you feeling today? Yeah, good, good. How about you? Yeah, no bad. I'm really excited to, to be talking dinosaur once again uh, for all our audiences. It's always really, really exciting. So we'll be, before we start in talking about your research, Dinosaur Hands, Gerard, can you tell us a little bit more about what you do in general terms uh, in the museum? So I'm a last year PhD student at the Natural History Museum and also University College London. And uh, my PhD research focus on, as you said, on dinosaur hands, how the different hands of the, all the different groups of dinosaurs, how do they evolve, how, they, how do they differ from each other, and if those differences are related with the different functions they would use those hands for. So whether they were walking on their forelegs or they were using them to grab or slash uh, things or just, any way they would just interact with their, their environment at the time. And uh, you normally work with museum collections, looking uh, into them and, and finding out more from them. But sometimes, as we are seeing in the picture, you, you've gotten the, the chance to, to travel around the world and being on a, on a dig, but you also travel around looking at those collections that you work with as well, don't you, Joao? Yeah, so these photos uh, we are showing are from last year's uh, Mission Jurassic, and I was really fortunate to to go to my first ever paleo paleo dig, and it was really exciting to actually see the bones coming out of the rock. Uh, but during my PhD, most of the time I was very, again, very fortunate, very lucky to actually travel across the world, visiting all these different museums, and collect data for my research. So looking at the actual looking at the actual fossils, uh, taking a lot of photographs, taking a lot, and also generating a lot of the 3D models that I use for my work. We'll talk uh, more thoroughly about your research throughout the show, Joao, but uh, I've got a question that I always like to um, ask our, our paleontologists, our, our scientists at the museum. Were you always into dinosaurs, in, especially when you were little? Always, always. Since very young age, I've always obsessed by dinosaurs. I, have, I, have, I still have uh, all of my toys back home, uh, a lot of the magazines, books, movies, documentaries. I would watch and read them all, uh, and it's something that I've always stuck to uh well when growing up and it's always something i've always been interested in uh when i got to university i actually went to study biology because it was also a topic that i've always been interested in and i actually went through the route to more like uh, conservation genetics and and studying actual living animals uh so i used to study um, foxes that are found in the sahara desert in the north in north africa uh, but then when I got to when I moved to London to do my PhD, uh, there was this opportunity to to do this project and to study dinosaurs, and there was just a little kid still in the back of my mind, just going do it, do it, do it, do it, do it, and I haven't regretted. It has been a fun couple of years since then. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that the, your little you will be really really excited. So, Joao, you have to um, explain to your younger self when you were little, um, what is a dinosaur? Um, what would you say to them? How would you define a dinosaur? What makes a dinosaur a dinosaur? Uh, so there's a lot of characteristics that define a dinosaur. Uh, one of the key ones is they have this more uh, erect structure of the, their limbs. So the limbs are tucked up underneath the body. So think of more like um, you see in an elephant or a horse nowadays, uh, or birds as well, instead of this more uh, reptilian sprawling sprawling mm -hmm. gait that you see in crocodiles and and lizards i mean there's there's a lot of there's a lot of other features in, in the skull and the rest of the body but this is one of the main ones and and people think that uh, back in the triassic when triassic period when dinosaurs first start to emerge and their and their immediate ancestors uh, this this uh, configuration of the limbs allowed them to succeed and to outcompete other space other species at the time they would make them more nimble more agile and allow them to eat more and just be more success, successful uh, in their environment. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we look at, at dinosaurs, um, 
if, if we look closely, we'll see that, yeah, they have the legs underneath the body, like you said as well. But what we also can see is that some of them, like uh, Tyrannosaurus rex or um, uh, Deinonychus, for example, the, the bipedal dinosaurs, you can differentiate quite well the legs and the arms. But then if you look at things like uh, sauropods, like Diplodocus or Triceratops um, in, in, in a different group, they have, they, they are kind of like quadrupeds. They, they are four-legged dinosaurs, but they still have legs and arms. They, they, we can differentiate the two limbs there, can we? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, we tend, as humans, tend to think of our hand as a very special thing, and we use them to grab and maybe some other primates as well. But it's, regardless of any, any animal, uh, any tetrapod animals, so I think anything from amphibians all the way to, to mammals, have a forearm which at the end ends in a in a in a hand or, or and in terms of anatomical terms it's called a manus and it doesn't matter if it's shaped uh, or if it's adapted to just walking or if it's used to grabbing things or it's or has been completely transformed into a wing or a flipper the the bones the bones that compose the, this structure are the same and you call them, and they call the same names they might sh the, the shape are going to be different some bones are lost some others are added in but it's always comes from the same ancestor. So even even wings would be, in a way, hands uh, that are adapted to to that kind of activity of life. For example, we had a, a question from YouTube where they where they're asking were dinosaur hands uh, actually hands or wings, as in chickens. We we can talk about that later. But in general, wings are also uh, adapted yeah. hands. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, a wing. If if it's a bird or or a pterosaur or a bat nowadays, they're all still the, the hands, but they've just been co-adapted for this very specific task. And sometimes they've lost some other some other other functionalities. Uh, as the same applies, for example, if you look at whales or dolphins or any other more marine, especially like think of ichthyosaurs and other marine animals um, that adapted their hands to to have these kind of like flippers that help them swim. So it's it's always the same. It's always the same. The, the bony structure is always the same. It just gets adapted differently. And and when you look at dinosaurs, you really, really see that. You see uh, more claw-like hands uh, or hands that look more like our, our own hands, the ones that we can see when we look mm -hmm. at our hands. But you also see like big tree trunks hands in, in, the, in those uh, four-legged uh, dinosaurs. So, uh, Joel, let's look at some really cool examples of, of dinosaurs' hands with we've uh, gathered together. And I think if we're talking about dinosaur hands, we cannot not start talking about a Tyrannosaurus rex and uh, the mystery of the small hands. So uh, why, why are the arms so small, uh, Draw? Do we know? I mean, that's that's the moment I mentioned to anyone what I'm doing for my PhD, they, the, the, the first question is, what about T-Rex? It's instant. Uh, and what about T-Rex? Yeah, the short, the short answer is, Still, un, still unknown. We're not really sure. Uh, so T-Rex and the family that belongs to these Tyrannosaurids are all known to having these really massively built skulls, and it was adapted to have these really strong bite forces. So they the, probably the way they lived and the way they they hunt or scavenge scavenge for food, they really don't, didn't need arms that much. They they could they could do well with only using their skulls uh, to get everything they needed. Um, so basically, the arms just kind of become uh, vestigial in that sense. But if there's actual um, fossils of more juvenile specimens of T-Rex, and people have been studying how how the all these different animal how these animals grow through time, and in more juvenile species, the 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 length of the arm is relatively more normal or closer to other to other theropods, all these carnivorous dinosaurs that use their hands more actively. And so, but then as the animal grows, basically the arm doesn't. It uh, doesn't grow as much, doesn't grow as quick as the rest of the body. So it ends up being this more like a, a shrunk version of an arm. But it's still, it's still well built. Like it's, it still has a lot of uh, important muscle scars where the muscles will be attached to the bones. It still has functional, it still has claws and the, fing the fingers, even though it's just two of them, but they'll still be functional. So people thought they might have helped them to um, help to clutch prey when they were trying to bite them, or at least just try to secure them. Uh, and maybe when they were juveniles, because they weren't as big, maybe they would still do more actively use their arms to catch prey or catch smaller, smaller lizards and mammals at the time. So they weren't completely useless. They they would definitely no. like uh, no, um, no. But there there are there are yeah. worse cases where they probably there are dinosaurs where their arms were probably useless or 
very well yeah i was gonna ask you about that so we always talk about knee rakes but they're all the dinosaurs in fact there's another quite uh big and scary one uh with uh with the smaller is that right yeah so i mean again every time people mention talking asking me about t-rex and then i, I explain about it and then i was oh but you should have looked to these these ones over here which is the so this as we see now this is a, an example this is a carnotaurus uh, and it belongs to a family belongs a family of theropods called the abelisaurids and and these these dinosaurs are besides having these really also massive skulls with a lot of ornament bony ornamentation so carnotaurus is famous for having these uh, bony horns in their in their skulls uh, but another famous characteristic is these really short stubby arms and in this case it's the entire arm that's probably vestigial uh, the way the, the, the elbow joints and all, all the articulation between the bones look very weird, the proportions don't seem right, and the hand is very atrophied, so they lose a lot of these first phalanges, these first elements of the, of the fingers. Uh, they don't really have any proper claws. So people are still kind of puzzled, why, why do these structures exist? Why are they using them for? What are they using them for? So I mean, so, so this is these are the arms of Carnotaurus, the, the ones we were showing earlier, and the first bones to your right, I guess, uh, are the your humerus? So this is the first first bone of your arm. Then there's two bones are the radius and the on the and the lower arm. And then the rest of the bones, which are a bit a bit mushed up together, th those are, are the, the hands. Uh, and it's just very weird. Some people have proposed maybe they use them for some kind of display function at least, try to wave their arms, maybe try to impress a, a potential mate. But it, it's very 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 weird case. I just have got this image of a carnotaurus just going like that. Just waving around, very, very silly, kind of like, yeah, it's very, very weird. We'll have to keep investigating. That's something that I always find amazing, but uh, we still need to find out so much, and there's so many questions to answer. But let's move on to some uh, famous claws of uh, UK specimens, Ra, because we have really amazing specimens in the UK, really cool stories behind them. Uh, one of these famous specimens, uh, is baryonyx, um, oh, and it had a huge, formidable claw, quite big as well, and 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 with a specific use. Can you tell us a little bit more about about this dinosaur? Yeah. So baryonyx is probably the most famous uh, UK theropod, UK dinosaur, or at least definitely one of the most famous ones. Um, and it's famous, it belongs to the group Spinosaurus, so it also belongs to the same family as Spinosaurus, and. Uh, this group is famous for having these skulls that look kind of look very crocodilian, and they're always found in these uh, these environments where they used to be either swampy or kind of like lake river systems. And they often they'll find also like fish scales and fish fossils as well around these uh, these areas. And Baryonyx is famous for having this really massive claw in, in its first finger, so that will be in your you know, equivalent to your thumb. And what people think of is these animals would be more eating fish. So think of when you see in the documentaries uh, bears in the United States and Canada when they go to the rivers and they try to catch salmon going up the, going going up the river and they just kind of like whack them off or try to claw them. People have been suspecting maybe baryonyx and animals like that would do something similar, or at least would help them at least tear up carcasses, for example, or at least just opening up, just getting better access to flesh. Mm -hmm, absolutely, and these clothes were quite big. We've got a 3D print museum, and they were like about yeah, size of my face, something like that. This is the yeah. it's pretty big animal. That's amazing. Um, now another really really cool um British specimen with a really cool story. I really love this story. Is a uh, iguanodon and and a relative Mantellosaurus, um, and the thumb spike. So we can see in this picture here that they are resting their hands, but you can see the thumb spike pointing uh, forward over there. Can you tell us a little bit more about the, the uh, Iguanodon or Mantellosaurus thumb spike? Uh, so Iguanodon was one of the first ever dinosaurs to have been described and uh, by Gideon Mantell, and then also part of the three species that uh, Sir Richard Owen, the founder of the Natural History Museum, used to define the group uh, Dinosauria. Uh, but when they first found this thumb spike, they found it isolated, and they really didn't know where it comes from. They've, at the time, iguana means iguana teeth. So they just found these, these was these giant lumbering lizards and they thought the thumb spike was actually a horn. So they just put it in the, in the front of the skull. Uh, so if you go to, nowadays, if you go to Crystal Palace Park in South London, there's these really uh, old, but wonderfully weird uh, reconstructions. And you can see what people thought these animals looked like back in the day. And that thumb spike is actually, they, they thought it was a horn. It was only later uh, when in Belgium, they found completely articulated 
uh, iguanodons, they were actually like, oh, wait a minute, this is actually this is actually in the hand, which makes it even even weirder because it's it's a structure that you don't see in any other animal, living or extinct, uh, and we're still very unsure of what they would actually use them. So it's it's now it's present in iguanodon and uh, and their and its relatives. So it's kind of this family of dinosaurs. They're famous for that. And some of them had like relatively small thumb spikes, other had really massive thumb spikes. Um, and people think maybe they would use them for some sort of defense or most likely at least some intraspecific combat. So trying to, again, during like, for example, mating season or something like that, they could be fighting members of their own species. Uh, or even people suggested maybe it was uh, some kind of tool to help them uh, get uh, take bark out of trees or even opening some more tough tough seeds that was part of their diet. But it's still, we still need to do a bit more science on them and actually try to simulate what they actually be able to do with these weird structures. Figuring out a little bit more about, about those structures, as, as at least we're putting them in the in the right place at the moment. Now, uh, uh, relative to one of them, um, Joao Mantelisaurus has a skeleton of, of bear, a fossil skeleton of bear, has a very special place in the museum. When you come in into the Hins Hall, you can see it in one of the wonder bays. Um, why, why is this specimen so important? Why do we have it there? So it's definitely one of, it's one of the, or the most complete uh, dinosaur found in the UK. So it's 80 to 90% complete. So when you go to the museum and what you see on display, most of it is real bone. So that's always exciting. Uh, and it's also a very important specimen because it's the holotype for the, the species. So the holotype is the, it's, it's the, it's the specimen that defines that species. So if you ever find, in terms of fossils, if you ever find in the field another bone that you think, oh, this might be Mantellisaurus, you need to compare it with this one to actually call it a Mantellisaurus. Uh, and luckily last year, we, uh, I was part of the team that we actually took all the bones out, at least as much as we could, to call these bones out. Uh, put them on display in, in a specific room on the museum so the public could watch this. And we took uh, a lot of a lot of photos, and we also 3D scanned them so we could make them available for well, for our own studies, which we hope to publish soon, uh, and also just make them accessible for any other any other researcher that needs to that wants to look at this specimen because it's a reference specimen. So every time you want to do every, every time you want to study this family of dinosaurs, you need to take into account this specimen and, and others. Um, so yeah, it was a very. It's, it's uh, this way at least we avoid uh, damaging the bones, and we have, and we avoid having to, for example, opening this glass case all the time and and ruin the experience for the public. They always, it's always better to see uh, a complete dinosaur instead of one that's missing a bone because it's being studied. And I suppose it's also making it more accessible as well. There might be people who can travel to the museum to see it, or even. Uh, in situations like the one we've lived uh, recently, when we can't uh, go visit other institutions because uh, we can't travel around the world because of a pandemic, I suppose it must have been really, really useful to have iguan, uh, sorry, Mantellosaurus, but also all the specimens that you might have scanned on the on the museum database, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. That, that's one of the main things that at least paleontology and a lot of science do nowadays is they try to digitize their specimens, make them available online. So even the museum has a Sketchfab uh, website where they put a lot of the 3D models of specimens, even even Hope the Blue Whale is there. Um, and uh, you, can do a lot of, you can do a lot of cool stuff with uh, 3D models and 3D scanning nowadays. You can Besides getting the 3D model, you can then, for example, actually uh, 3D print it. So this is an example I have from another another different type of dinosaur. Uh, so this is called Adeopapasaurus. I'm just putting it in front of my face. Uh, Adeopapasaurus. So this is uh, from Argentina, and it's one of the ancestors of uh, Diplodocus and Brachiosaurus. It's kind of sauropods, and it's just and this is life size. So even if I if I forgot to study something, or even if I need to double check or take another photo of anything, I can watch it from the comfort of my own house. Uh, I can easily share this 3D file to other researchers. Uh, I can then make, make it available for, some, sometimes other museums won't have this kind of like 3D, uh, 3D software and 3D things. I can send them the file and they can 3D print it and show them and use them for public outreach um, activities. Um, so yeah, it's a very, very interesting, fascinating uh, times we live in, in, in terms of like what technology allows us to do. Right. That's really, really cool, Joao. And I'm glad that you have that there to show us. Um, we, we have some, a, a bit more about your research and your, your 3D prints. I know that you were really, really happy to have them back as well. Uh, yeah, but we yeah. have 
questions uh, coming from from our audience Rao, and uh, there's a it's a very interesting question coming from youtube uh, they're asking is it possible small robot dinosaurs might have used their forms to defend themselves and was kicking the front legs possible could they defend themselves with their front legs do we know uh so the so sauropods um actually they so as I show, as again, just picking up on this example. So for example, if you can see these, these the ancestors of sauropods have like three, three big claws with them. But then once you get to proper sauropods, so again, giant uh, dinosaurs like Diplodocus and Brachiosaurus, they still have one claw on their on their first finger. Uh, and people think that maybe they will have they will use these to actually defend from predators. I mean, besides having this large size, so that's already intimidating, and 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 uh, any other theropod would not mess up with mess with a big adult. Dinosaur like that, but they could. People think that sauropods could probably rear up on their hind, on their hind legs, on their front, on their back legs, and then try to stomp and try to slash, uh, and use their the, their arms to defend themselves. Or even sometimes it would just having this claw would also help them uh, move around if the if the ground was a bit more loose or something would actually help them to actually hook around and actually help them move. Or if they needed to actually reach an even taller a taller tree, they can use that almost like just to attach themselves to the to the tree. And reach for the the leaves all the way in the top. So yeah, I think they okay. probably use it. even just stomping. You don't want to get just stomped by a massive sauropod. That that would hurt. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much, uh, Charles, for that answer. Let's go back to to uh, talking weird and wonderful um, examples. So we talk about there's more hands of Panotaurus and T Rex, uh, but there's all the dinosaurs that also had really, really tiny hands. Uh, Mon Mononychus is one of them, isn't it? Yeah, so, the, so this is a Mononychus. It's uh, it's part of this family of the little theropods called Alvarisaurids. Uh, and they're, they're, again, they're very small, chicken-sized, dog-sized, they're not very big animals. Um, but they're famous, among other things, famous for these really stumpy looking arms and which end in only one single claw. So it's again, it's this, it's your thumb, equivalent to your thumb. And they lost all the fingers or the bones were all merged and fused up together into this massive, uh, to the massive bone. And despite this very odd looking shape and these weird bones, they actually looked like they were very stoutly built. They would probably uh, allow a lot of strong musculature to be attached to it. So what people think these animals would use these these weird arms for is most kind of like what anteaters do today. So they would be insectivores, and they would just find an ant's nest or or a termite's nest, or even sometimes either either a mount or sometimes in a tree, and try to rip it rip it open and and and, and feed on the, and feed on the insects. So that's that's one of the theories. But it's still again like ma many things in paleontology is still a bit unknown. And the more you study them, the more we will find. There you go. And then, uh, oh, we have a, a, a very cool uh, question coming from Facebook as well. Joe asks, would sauropods front claws uh, be used for digging nests? Um, I don't know if they question. dig in nests for themselves or digging nests of other animals to then from them. Uh, no, I mean, potentially probably would help because, uh, I mean, dinosaur sauropods would lay eggs. I don't, I, I'm not sure how. I think they, the uh, sauropod nests and even sauropod morphs and all those kind of families, they're, they're a bit fun, fossilized nests and eggs and even little embryos. So they've been found. I can't, I can't really actually remember what's the shape of the nest, but they probably do at least, at least some kind of little mount or at least just to keep all the eggs uh, close together. So that they probably would use that or try to dig up, uh, dig up something for sure. I suppose you use whatever it's, it's on hand. So and they literally. I mean, sometimes from. sometimes when when we always infer these kind of things. But I mean, sometimes even if you look at animals today, you would look if you just had the skeletons, like oh, they would not be capable to doing that. And then you see a video on YouTube of an animal doing something like how how is it how is that animal doing that? Uh, <laughs> so so it's a lot of it's it's just the best we can do with with the evidence that we have. But I mean, sometimes it, there's always there's always a possibility that something strange and weird and wonderful uh, these dinosaurs could do. And in fact, talking about weird and wonderful and unexpected and how you can't judge a dinosaur by their hands. Uh, yeah. I think the hand of big, big hands, uh, one of the largest hands in the dinosaur wall um, from Daikiras, isn't it? You've got a picture. I mean, they're impressive. Every time I've, I've seen the, this picture, I'm like, okay, that's big. I will be scared of that. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, these are these, this, these are very famous specimen. Uh, so this is from from Mongolia, and the, these arms, together with together with a couple of ribs and everything, were found in the late '60s, beginning of the '70s, and they only found this of the animal. So they they even call it the species name Dinocaris means terrible hand because they just found these very scary looking long finger long arms. Uh, but they didn't find the rest of the animal until the later, uh, until like the the two thousands, where they finally found a couple more bones that they could compare with, and they found the rest of the, the animal. And and surprisingly, the rest of the animal is as weird or even weirder than than the arms. So yeah, this is this is a reconstruction of it. Uh, first off, again, longer arms we were expecting it would be a big animal. It is a big animal, so almost like almost size of a T Rex or something like that, like up to eleven meters. It belong, uh, people, uh, researchers found out it belonged to the um, to this family of uh, Ornithomimosaurs. So this is like the ostrich-like dinosaurs. I think of Gallimimus in Jurassic Park and those kind of weird-looking dinosaurs. It had this really weird, weird-looking skull and this weird-looking um, beak, and then not really, not like a sail like you see on Spinosaurus, but it had also this bony hump uh, in its back, and and it's just people are not really sure where what's going on with this animal. Um, and even at the end of the tail, they also found these, uh, the end of the tail, the way it, the bones, the last couple of bones are structured, it suggests it had this kind of like fluff at the end, a couple of feathers uh, and this kind of structure it suggests it probably has some kind of like this weird um, uh, feather-like kind of structure at the end of the tail. So again, something quite different to what they imagine at the beginning that it might like Complete, I mean yeah. it is it is quite terrible because it's quite big and it's scary but I don't think it, it, it looks as scary as, as maybe the first uh, paleontologist thought it might do. Yeah I mean it was probably not a very it wasn't like a vicious um, meat-eating dinosaur it was probably more um, omnivore because it was, it was found near these like uh, swamp river areas again with a lot of uh, you can tell a lot from looking at the rocks you can tell a lot about what the environment was and they also found a lot of like uh, fish and other aquatic uh, animals, fossils like that. And um, so what people think is, this, especially because looking at the skull, because the way it has the, the beak, uh, it was probably more omnivorous diet. So maybe even eating a bit of fish, a lot of plant material, maybe some insects. Uh, it might have, I mean, depending on how the animal grew, probably the, the diet would shift as well as the animal grew larger and larger. Uh, so it probably used these gigantic arms to just reach out uh, to their food, crab, or maybe even as just a defense uh, against uh, predators. That's amazing. Um, now, Joao, we've seen really cool representation of uh, representations of dinosaurs, and we've also had a look at how you know how the way we see dinosaurs have changed since the first ones that we discovered, like Iguanodon or, or, or so on. I think popular culture has a lot to do with how we we look at dinosaurs, and if we think of popular culture and and and. Uh, and dinosaurs, we, we can't help it but think about Jurassic Park. Now, hands in Jurassic Park, though, that's your, your topic. We won't get into any other things, but hands in Jurassic Park, they don't, mm, they don't meet very well. There's, there's a bit of an issue in how they're represented, there, isn't there? Yeah, it's one of my pet peeves in a lot of people. Uh, issues. Uh, so, I mean, the the movie is wonderful, and it's responsible for a lot of like the renaissance you see in in paleontology and getting a lot of people interested in this in the subject. So, it doesn't ruin the movie in itself. Uh, but a lot of the bipedal, all the big carnivores, especially the T Rex and the Velociraptors in the movie, are always portrayed with their hands st sticking like that, uh, which is kind of look like more like a zombie. And actually, all these dinosaurs and the more like the resting position of the hands actually more on the side. So dinosaurs were not piano players, they were actually clappers, or at least they were able to do this kind of movement. But this time, you're, you're probably breaking their wrists. They would not be able to, they probably could do some kind of level of, of uh, pronation knowledge, this kind of this movement. Um, but yeah, so, and it's kind of saying, it's kind of like a little detail that doesn't change the story at all. It's just making things a bit, look a bit uh, closer to reality. And but it's, it's, it's just one of those things where, Maybe some paleo art or something just in the past, he used to portray dinosaurs like that. And it's some things just linger on and just get stuck in the in the memory of everyone. And just people think, oh, these dinosaurs <laughs> look like this. Uh, when actually nowadays we're pretty much convinced that they would look something more like, like this, especially the raptors, uh, feathers all around, these very dynamic uh, looking animals, 
their their wrists very folded so a lot of these animals already show characteristics that you can see nowadays in modern birds and especially on the, on the birds especially on the wrist the, these animals probably could fold their could fold their hands very flexibly which allows nowadays birds to very neatly tuck their tuck their wings under their body and protect their wings when they're just resting that's amazing. That is still, I mean, still a very scary animal for me, at least. I mean, I wouldn't like to encounter this uh, veloc velociraptor, the Deinonychus, actually, uh, around there. But yeah, that's it's 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 a lovely it's a lovely anecdote about the hands because I mean, you were saying before that in other shows when we used to do them with live audiences, you, you used to ask people how do a dinosaur, and people would just go, like you said, yeah. somebody like a piano player. Yeah. Yeah, now I think often I, I did that a couple of times in the Nature Lives at the museum, and often the adults would put their hands like that, and then all the kids would put their hands like correctly. So kudos for everyone that. that <laughs> I, I have to admit I've been corrected a couple of times. I've done that. And I've, <laughs> it's what, like, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's, it, it, it's, what, it's what you see. It's what you see, and even now <laughs> even in, in the latest latest installments of the Jurassic Park franchise, everything they still keep that. So. It, it will still it will still be around It'll still be around <laughs> we'll clap like that we'll clap. Yeah. Yeah. exactly everyone should clap <laughs> <and sales too. laughs> joe had a couple more questions coming from our viewers and um, a couple of questions from uh facebook so helena is asking regarding putting bones in the wrong places as opposed she refers to one mm -hmm. is there any other way to know where a bone should be placed other than finding all the more complete skeletons so how do you go on about actually putting the, the bones in the right place. Oh, really good, really good question. Um, okay, so when, when it's weird bones like that, is often there's no other way of you finding where it's actually gonna go if you don't find an articulated specimen showing more or less how the how the bones are positioned against each other. Uh, larger, larger bones, for example, bones of your arm, bones of your skull, bones of, of, of your back, of your vertebral column, you usually can figure out, okay, this is a bone that belongs to this part of the body, and it probably looks more or less like you can compare it with other extinct animals, and you can also compare it with modern animals. So that's why back in the day, Richard Owen and all the, the, these first people studying dinosaurs, they were mostly just comparing with modern animals, and they were comparing with birds and crocodiles. Even you can compare with mammals, because despite the bones, you can tell the difference between, for example, a mammal. Let's think of a femur, your leg bone. You can tell the difference between a, a femur of a mammal and a femur of a crocodile or a dinosaur. But overall, it's still a femur. Uh, it's just slightly, slighter differences. So yeah, when it's really, really weird structures like the thumb spike, yeah. I mean, if 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 those, those amazing fi findings in Belgium uh, of the complete iguanodons. I highly recommend if you ever go to Belgium, if you ever go to Brussels, to go to the museum because they still have these tens, tens or fifteen animals just complete them all, all, all in, in exhibit. If they hadn't found it, we probably would still think of an iguanodon having a horn. Maybe, maybe if we found the skull and then you would see, oh wait, what is it actually attached to? It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't attach because if if a, if a if a if a skull had a horn, it probably has somewhere in the skull where it would attach to. So it, it, eventually, I think we would have figured it out, even if we didn't find uh, a complete skeleton, for example. Brilliant answer. Thank you so much, Ra. We're getting more questions as well. Uh, there's another question from Facebook. Um, they were asking, uh, Lee was asking, could sauropods take the hind legs off the ground and lean on front legs to stand to kick out, out a predator? Where I, when it comes to mind, it's maybe a horse or a donkey. A kicking, um, yeah. Oh. With the back legs, do you think they could have done that, or is it something I, that I don't think has anyone? No one they didn't. actually tested that, and it could, because they're so heavy animals, so really, the I mean, if, if an animal like that, for example, falls, it would probably damage, get injured very badly. So they would probably try to always very keep it very balanced. Uh, they probably could. I mean, one leg at a the time, they probably could kick it, but even just moving such a large a large leg also takes a lot of energy. Uh, and they had these massive tails as well. So think, think of, a, for example, of Diplodocus has this really long, really long tail that people think they might have used as a defense, as almost like a whip, uh, and would really use it as a defense mechanism. Uh, some people have done uh, some, so, so sometimes when di dinosaurs would go into rivers or something like that, because sometimes they would be very front heavy. So sometimes they would be buoyant a bit more. So maybe the back legs would not, if you, they would not touch the, 
in a rock in a, in a water they probably might, might have not touch the, the 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 river surface but regardless yeah not really sure maybe they one one leg at a time maybe but two legs like a donkey probably hard yeah i think we should think about them more like elephants or hippos and then and you yeah how it might have been a bit more difficult exactly exactly absolutely now draw another question and this might test your knowledge of virus as well i'm sure you will know this one uh, okay. another question Spoke, they're asking, did, and I'm, I'm going to see if I can pronounce this properly, did Therizinosaurus have larger claws than the previously mentioned uh, Deinocheros, and do you think the two might have coexisted? I think Therizinosaurus is the one with very, very large claws, yeah. claws I think I've seen him before. Yeah, so Therizinosaurus uh, is probably the one with the largest, longest claws, so they're very, they're very long, and they're not, they're not very curved, but they're very long, almost looks like a a very dangerous scythe um and yeah they they, they were found in the same environment so they probably could i'm not sure, i can't remember now if they were found they were found they're both from mongolia in the more or less the same environment i can't remember if in terms of age would they have coincided or not um but they were living in similar environments and teresinosaurs are, are these very weird group of theropods so they're they're part of the carnivorous uh theropods carnivorous dinosaurs but they're actually their diet was probably again a bit more omnivorous or actually be almost um uh, full herbivorous uh and they sometimes people will portray them as these almost like equivalent of these gigantic ground sloths that you would see also these extinct giant sloths that these exist just very weird looking animals and using these massive claws these massive hands to actually try to reach for uh foliage try to reach for leaves of trees and and brushes and 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 get the food they needed and also having these massive claws would definitely be very scary for a predator to to try to attack them i imagine they are really really impressive we don't have a picture of them in in this show but if people want to look it up uh they they are they're really really cool now Joe, before we finish the show i want to talk a bit about your research a bit more in depth of what you do um at the museum uh, but we have a, a question from Noah, who is six, and uh, they're asking, could pterodactyls uh, land on the on other dinosaurs' horns, like Triceratops, for example? But we have to say pterodactyls are not dinosaurs. We have to mm -hmm. yeah. make that clear. But do you think they could have landed on other dinosaurs? Maybe like uh, birds look, do today, like you see some um, oh. on, on bulls and, and so on. Yeah, people people suspect that like the smaller the smaller pterosaurs, uh, they were very very small and they could probably just land on a big gigantic sauropod and maybe like you see birds today with uh, rhinoceros and elephants just like pluck uh, parasites or or any other insects uh, flying around. So that that probably would have happened for sure. At least these smaller uh, pterosaurs and and also these all these primitive birds as well when they when birds because I mean. These first birds and these first flying birds start, start showing up, even even in the latest Jurassic or at least the beginning of the Cretaceous period. Um, so there was a lot of things uh, flying and flapping around, and then eventually, and then and then you also have these massive pterosaurs uh, with these massive wingspans. But they were more imagine more, I would say in terms of ecology, imagine more like uh, vultures or something like that. They were just soaring around and looking for a, looking for a. a carcasses and stuff like that to eat. Uh, but yeah, pterosaurs, sure, the smaller ones could definitely just land on a, on a, on a, on a, <laughs> on a gigantic herb for sure. That's a, that's a beautiful image. I, I, I'm going to see if any paleo artists have done something similar. I'm probably, I'm not, but, even, yeah. even in the Walking with Dinosaurs, those kind of documentaries, I think they've, they, they, they've done that. Something similar. Uh, now, Joel, on your research, can you tell us a little bit more um, about about it? Uh, so, for example, what are you trying to figure out? What are, what are the things that you're trying to? What are the questions that you're trying to answer? Okay, so I so again, as, as I said earlier, I I went around using the collections in the museum here in London, but also going around the world visiting the diff different institutions, and I just looking looking at the looking at the individual bones of the of these hands of all these different types of dinosaurs. Uh, taking a lot of photographs, taking a lot of measurements, taking a lot of notes, and also and also do a lot of 3D scanning. And scanning you can use, like in this image, I'm using a proper uh, a 3D scanner, which automatically generates in your laptop, on your computer, generates a 3D model. Another way of, uh, that people do make 3D models is actually just using photos. It's something almost anyone in at home can do it. It's just taking photos, 360 degrees photos in different angles of an, of an object, whatever object you want to do. And then there's specialized software that picks all these photos and 
creates a 3D model. So that's called photogrammetry. Uh, and then for all this raw data that I collected, I can look at the using measurements. I can just look how the, the different proportions of the elements change between the different hands and within the different bone. So how so often um, animals that walk that walk on their four on their four legs will have the the, the bones uh, are more stoutly built, more massive. Uh, if, for example, picking up another another 3D print here, so if animals are actually using their hands to grab stuff, often the fingers are, are much are, are longer, more slender. So it just allows them to actually do a lot of like this kind of movement, grabbing movement, try to grab prey. Um, also, uh, and also one of interesting, yeah, with this slide I can also talk about that. Um, dinosaurs are interesting because all the early dinosaurs, the first dinosaurs, were all bipedal. So they were only walking on their back legs, which is already, if you think of all the animals that ever existed and exist now, it's always very, it's something very rare. It's basically us humans, birds, which are dinosaurs, uh, and maybe sometimes a couple, a couple of few mammals and a couple of lizards. Usually animals will always walk on, walk on their forelegs. So all the, all these different, all these different groups of dinosaurs showed here, all of their ancestors were walking on their, on their back legs only. So they had their hands, the hands were free to, again, when, uh, interact with their environment and probably grab stuff, dig, and 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 and, and so on. But once they start becoming bigger uh, and having these, uh, for example, these massive skulls, for example, as you see in Triceratops, or just reaching these massive sizes and having and just becoming these really large herbivores, they go back at becoming uh, quadrupeds, so walking on their forelegs. So I'm, one of the things I'm really interested in looking at is how the the, the shape of the different bones in the hand changes from something that was adapted to grabbing to something that all of a sudden is just used for walking and sustaining sometimes literally tons and tons of weight. Uh, and all these different groups independently found different solutions and found the, and all of them, you can kind of recognize different hand shapes uh, from others. So, I mean, in sauropods, you have these weird, these almost like pillar-like structures and they lose a lot of, the, a lot of these fing finger bones here in the phalanges, they just lose them. So they're almost just walking on, on their knuckles, so kind of, yeah, kind of like that picture over there, that's the giraffe titan, so kind of like a brachiosaurus. Uh, or then, for example, you have stuff like Stegosaurus and Sophie, or the um, Triceratops, it kind of like, it's more, they look more like an, what you see uh, an elephant hand looks like nowadays. Or, you, and then you have, the, for example, the weird cases of the iguanodons, and later on, hadrosaurs, where, so I can almost, you have the thumb spike here coming out, but then they will only walk basically on these middle fingers here. And then, and then, uh, yeah, and then this finger, maybe some people think the pinky was actually movable. Maybe they could actually hold stuff with that finger. But then it, later on, once they, once you start seeing, oh yeah, so that's just so in the picture, that's the 3D image I got, the 3D model I got here. So this is one of the earliest times. <laughs> uh, um, but yeah, every, every different group of animal independently reach went to quadrupedal and got to different solutions to the hand to support this weight and to uh, more effectively move around their environment. That's amazing. Now, uh, well, we're reaching the end of the show again, but we had a couple of uh, really, really interesting questions coming from, from our audience. And we had a, um, a tricky question from YouTube. Um, I might put you a little bit on the spot, but I'm putting our scientists on the spot. Uh, they're asking, what is the best fossil discovery or discovery in general that you've personally made? What would you say if you have highlights, something that you've discovered? Uh, Joao, if, something I, that, if, uh, if I've discovered a fossil, research. if I found a fossil or something about my research, what's... Uh... I would say, I would, for me, it would be more interesting to know about your research. Have you found something that you went, oh my yeah. God, that blew my mind? Um... I mean, at least I got really excited when, for example, talking about this, uh, the quadrupedal, bipedal transitions and that kind of thing. Uh, it's really cool that you kind of see these, this, despite all these groups uh, achieving different uh, solutions independently, there's still at least these two ways they went went via it. So you, you can kind of see these sauropods and also the iguanodons, hadrosaurs, they kind of have this kind of like very almost like pillar-like, even look at the entire arm, kind of like this pillar-like structure, a bit more, um, everything very bundled together and just waiting, almost like not one, not sustaining in one point, but almost like that. And then on the other side, you're gonna have stuff like the Stegosaurus and Ceratopsians, which is a bit more sprawled using all their fingers, kind of like just holding the holding the weight. And you can see that very, if you look at the shape of the bones and some other things, you can actually see them, how they, 
differ from each other. And when you when you when you use this statistical analysis, they kind of just group each other uh, differently. So that's one of the things I've I've been interested to find. And then honestly, a lot of the things that we I'm comparing because a lot of people have been studying hands before, but often they'll just focus on one group or they focus often there's a lot of research for example on the bird evolution because you, people are interested how did the bird wing uh, evolve but then i'm actually one of the interesting things in my research is actually comparing yes yeah, so let's compare birds and carnivores and theropods and sauropods and all the different ones let's compare them all together and just see what's the pattern the pattern that comes out that's brilliant. That's really, really cool. Thank you so much. Uh, another question from Facebook. Sally is asking, uh, does bipedal have an advantage of a quadrupedal? That's a tricky question as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, not necessarily. It just depends because uh, being quadrupedal allows you to, first off, get bigger because you have you have more support you don't you have more support to have this and getting bigger is always advantageous. You don't get attacked by predators. Uh, even in terms of your Body temperature is more is more. It's easier to regulate your own body temperature, um, and allows you to. So it's good for a herbivore to have a really big gut, basically to have time to because eating plants takes a lot of time, takes a lot of energy to digest. Uh, so it's good to have a, the bigger the body is, the bigger the bigger the more space you have for a bigger gut. So there's more space, there's more time and space for the plant material once once the animal ate it to just be there and well ferment, digest. So the animal gets all the nutrients it needs. Um, so not necessarily. It just depends on whatever ecology uh, the animal is adapted to. And one one solution is not better than the other. It's just better for one thing, and might be bad for another. But vice versa. It's not. It's not so much what you do and how you do it, but what is around you and where you're as doing it, right? John? As well. As well. Yeah. 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 Joe, yeah, we're getting to the end of the show, uh, but I'd like to finish the show asking you a, a very big question. Why do you think it's important to understanding uh, animals, extinct animals like dinosaurs, for example, at the moment, if they're not around anymore? Because that's that's your reason you're studying uh, the evolution of animals that are still not around. Uh, I think the main reason is just to see uh... What, what are the actual limits of the of biology, let's say, in a very vague sense? So a lot of what you see in living animals nowadays, a lot of extinct animals would have never been able to do. But a lot of what, what you see in the past, what also all the living animals nowadays, would, they are not able to do anyway. So all these biological adaptations, these solutions, they are very specific to these groups. And, and it's always interesting to study the past so you can also understand how did we get here in the present and then how you can also kind of like use that to predict predict the future. And at least in case of dinosaurs, uh, paleontology is a much more diverse field. It's not only about dinosaurs, uh, but dinosaurs especially, I think it, they're an interesting group and they it's a interesting group because it, a lot of people are interested on them. They're kind of like these flashy, uh, dangerous looking uh, species. And so they use as almost like a gateway to get people interested in science and to have people uh, be involved in science. Uh, but there's much more you can do in paleontology and, and so on. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Art. That was a wonderful question. It, it really, really, you, you said really important things there. So thank you so much, Art, for joining us today. We've now reached the end of the show, but hopefully you will join us again in the future. And if you find anything new, please let us know and we'll, we'll get you in. To live life. Uh, I'm going to say goodbye to you now, but yeah, see you in the future. Take care. Bye, oh, Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today for another Nature Live Online. I really, really hope that you enjoyed the talk about dinosaur hands and, and found out more about the wonderful world that our dinosaurs, our diverse work that our dinosaurs. Now, if you want to see more dinosaurs, I need to remind you the museum is now open. We're still doing Nature Live Online to bring it to your homes, but you can book a free ticket and walk around the galleries of the museum and maybe have a look at those dinosaur hands and some of those dinosaur hands that Joao was talking about. Uh, but we are going to keep delivering Nature Life Online to you in your homes. And remember, we do it on Tuesdays like today at 12 and on Fridays at 10.30. We'll be coming with more exciting topics this, on fr this Friday and then next week on Tuesday. Uh, but that's all from me, Christina, today. I'm going to say goodbye to everyone and see you on the next one. Bye.